it is, it is uh, both a personal and a pre professional pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Paul Briggs. Um, he is a fascinating artist who began uh, truly a love affair with ceramics uh, since the ninth grade. And his pursuit of the uh, discipline did not follow a linear path or the usual path. And he has been a teacher, artist, philosopher, pastor, and he's studied both making and art education and has degrees, undergraduate degree from Alfred's uh, New York State College of Ceramics, Alfred University, and a PhD in education, which involves theory and policy from Penn State. He was an associate professor at Mass College of Art in Boston, and during those years also in residence at Harvard Ceramics Program. He's been in residence at uh, Archie Bray in Montana, um, but recently returned to his alma mater, uh, arguably the most prestigious ceramics program in the country at Alfred uh, University, where he is an illustrious uh, tenured faculty member. So please join me in giving a warm Charlotte welcome to Paul Briggs. Thank you, Annie. That was uh, encouraging. <laughs> I appreciate it. So she had all that memorized, too. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, it's my honor to uh, present here at the Mint Museum, and I would like to offer thanks to Andy Carlana, Senior Curator of Craft and Design and Fashion, for inviting me to be part of this exciting event, to Symphony Moreno, did I get this right, Director of Learning and Engagement, Maggie Capitai, or where's Maggie? Maggie Fuller, a uh, public programs educator and most per patient person that I've emailed with <laughs> in preparation for a talk to the collectors, Larry Lassiter and Gary Ferrer for bringing together some very fine craft. If I may say so myself, I just was able to take in some of the exhibition. And I used to say, well, I used to say a, a lot of things, but one thing I used to say is, when I'm in an exhibition with the Japanese, <laughs> I'll be so pleased because it's just long been uh, a body of work that just has inspired me. So uh, to the arts leadership of the Mint, and everyone who made it possible for Crafts Across Continents exhibition to take place, and for me to be, again, honored to be a part of it. And to all of you that are here, some all the way from Boston, Massachusetts, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for uh, coming out, and uh, I hope we'll have a, a good chat. So let me thank the media team for getting us all set up, and uh, how is the sound? Am I doing all right? Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, a little closer. Okay, how's that? Okay, use my outside voice here. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna stand down at the Dunhill. Exciting part of town. <laughs> All the arts are there. Okay, if I was uh, 25 years younger and had a lot of disposable cash, I see how Charlotte can really be fun city. <laughs> All right, 35 years. <laughs> okay, let's see where we are here. Okay. Okay, Martin Perrier. My favorite artist here. And William Kentridge. <laughs> I just wait for the giggle. 
Okay. Penland School of Crafts. And I'm, where's, uh, what's uh, Maggie's son's name? Zach. Zach, this is, a, this is me about to do the flip. <laughs> Probably for these pieces, definitely flipped. I see. All right. But it's definitely flipped nine, two, three, four, at least five times it gets flipped back and forth because those pieces get, get pinched while the piece is upside down and they get pinched toward me. Okay, so I'll try and make it clear how I'm making these. It's not always clear. <laughs> so, Cross Across Continents, uh, the title of this show feels like a needed understanding put into words of the power of crafts to bring people together. The debate around a perceived difference between craft and fine art is indeed simply one of perception. This is becoming more salient as fine art and design craft galleries increasingly cross borders. For me, it gets to the essential question about fine craft and art that has something to do with labor. There's this concept of aesthetic fitness. That is, there is something about our viewing and experiencing that responds to observed labor or the lack thereof. This can be heard from a negative point of view when someone who doesn't quite understand art makes the statement, but a child could have done that, not realizing that often drawing like a child has been the goal of the artist. Or we hear the more telling confession, I could have done that. And then there is the somewhat misplaced question, how long did it take you? Me. 35, 40 years. <laughs> how long did it take you? And then there are the positive responses, how did you do that? And then there's the somewhat misplaced, more positive response, how long did it take you? So what is aesthetic fitness? Let us take, for example, from the field of, I, I guess it's a field, bioaesthetics. It was definitely a course that I took at the Massachusetts College of Art. Uh, consider, if you will, the peacock's tail. In the course bioaesthetics, we studied that non-human plants and animals create a sort of aesthetic beauty. And in they range from various types of orchids to the well-known bowerbird. I, I love this slide because it's a, an installation of a bowerbird making an installation. <laughs> uh, the bowerbird to the peacock. One of my primary takeaways from the course was what, what it costs each creature or plant to perform its ritual, make its installation, or in the case of the peacock, to grow its tail. The larger and more colorful the peacock's tail, the greater the opportunities for the peacock to mate. And yet, the greater the size and more colorful the peacock's tail, there is also an increased risk to the peacock's life because they can be easily spotted by predators and they also can't get away as easily. But what is it about the peacock's tail that signals to a female peafowl that the peacock is fit as a mate? It is the fact of what it costs the peacock to grow the tail. The fact that the peacock has the biological resources to grow such a tail signals, if you will, a type of aesthetic fitness that signals reproductive fitness. All of a creature's or animal's aesthetic signaling is either for the purpose of reproduction or survival. And as in the case of the peacock, these two often clash. So I began to wonder, and when I was taking the course, uh, what did it mean for me as an MFA student 
Annie already mentioned that I was a pastor, and then I went back to work on my MFA. So we gave up a lot <laughs> in order to make that move. So I'm in this class, and I'm saying, that, that, what does it mean for me to have gone back in school in a later life, putting everything on the line for art's sake? For humans also signal aesthetic fitness. Very few hu humans can signal aesthetic fitness at the highest possible human level, as does Allison Felix, who became the most decorated Olympic athlete in 2021. The primary compelling attribute of sporting events is the fact that it costs athletes almost everything to compete at such a high level. And you can see that this is the case because often, not only do they talk about what it costs the athlete, if someone has overcome some particular challenges in their life, you know, if, you know, if they come from a particular neighborhood or you know, if, they, if, if they have a particular uh, ailment that they've overcome or if they had an accident or something like that and they recover from it and keep going, there's something about that that just gets our attention, that kind of labor. However, if you're unable, as are most of us, to signal aesthetic fitness at a world-class level, Alexander McQueen is willing to assist you in this department. And of course, it will cost you. You may be asking, how does all this apply to fine craft? Take, for instance, the wampum that was made by several different indigenous coastal peoples who had access to whelk shells. The labor-intensive nature of creating wampum gave it aesthetic and cultural value, a value not actually associated with a particular financial cause, but labor put into an object to signal the sincerity of the depth of the agreement made between peoples. Kind of like giving a wedding ring. <laughs> It's supposed to signal something, right? Non-indigenous Westerners who witnessed the way wampum was, was used could not understand such costly labor being put to that kind of social use. Yes, human labor can show aesthetic fitness, but it can also show a type of aesthetic value over and above the aesthetic object's material value. Indeed, the term aesthetic in philosophy falls under the category of axiology, which has to do with the, how we come to value things. Also, under axiology, we find the study of religion and ethics. Miller, in his article, Aesthetic Fitness, agrees that biologically, art must serve either a reproductive or a survival purpose, while also understanding that these often clash in Western society. So why else, asks the scientists, would the human species accept such a cost when there is no big reproductive or survival payoff? This is why we have the all too ubiquitous phenomena of the starving artists. Many of you are familiar with Yo-Yo Ma. Yo-Yo Ma finds himself on a street corner in New York City. <laughs> And he's playing, he's, you know, the, probably the most accomplished celloist, <laughs> you know, arguably, right, one of the best in the world. He's on a corner in New York City and he makes about $40. <laughs> he's there for hours and he collects about $40 in change. <laughs> the answer is because labor-intensive work signals an aesthetic fitness for humankind that has something to do with a person reaching toward the highest level of creation that is humanly possible, and that in itself has value. So when we go to a sporting event, we don't, we don't ever have to run as fast, jump as high, or climb as, as tall a mountain as those that we are witnessing. But watching them do it says this is something that is humanly possible. And so we all grow from that experience. Same is true when we're, when we're taking in other types of objects of beauty. It's just the, it's the best that we can do. Uh, there's a fellow that I read, and I, I can't remember who it is right now, and he's a confessed atheist, and he says that uh, if he had to pick some things that he would leave behind, one of the things that he would leave behind for, you know, for, you know, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, 
thousand years from now or whatever, would be the hallelujah chords. He says, not because I believe in it, it's, it's just the best that we've done. So he wants to leave those things that are just what, what, we, what we can strive for. In some groups, okay, these objects, whether maker or admirer, signal that human life is worth being surrounded by such beauty. It is not art for art's sake, it is art for human sake. In some groups, these objects take on a sacred quality for the community. Love the membrane bowl. Membrane bowls, everybody had their own bowl. And when the person died, they put a hole in the bowl and bury the bowl over top of that person's face. So that craft takes on this completely other level of importance uh, in particular communities. Okay. So it's not just artists who need to craft a life, craft a life, or craft a better life, for we all live better when we have objects we treasure around us. Beauty, or aesthetic experience, helps us craft a better life, but we often hear artists say they need time to live with a piece before releasing it for an exhibition. I also remember a conversation with one of my good friends whose mathematician daughter <laughs> chose to leave behind geometry and calculus to pursue a dream as a costume designer and worked with the costume designers uh, and the characters at Disney World. I remember my friend lamenting, why does art always win? Because this is also around the time when I left the pastorate to go back into the arts and then the daughter is also going through. I was like, art doesn't always win. There are people out there who are you know, making a, a bunch of money a year still lamenting <laughs> that they didn't pursue their art career. <laughs> but maybe they have a chance to do it anyway. So the primary point here, whether we are talking about fine art or fine craft, is that the toll that it can take on the artist can be equally costly. <laughs> I applaud my first year students on the first day of classes for being so courageous and brave. I actually say to them, so you want to be an artist. I applaud your bravery and courage to take on such an awesome role in our society. Because art doesn't always get accepted. But, like Alexander Rosenko, I was so pleased to find out that in star date 4858, <laughs> right, Clay, nevertheless, will still be getting pinched. Most of us became artists for reasons that have nothing to do with fine craft shows or sales. But now that the artists among us know what it costs to make art, you might be wishing you had doubled your prices. When we were younger, or when we started the arts, by and large, we probably continued to make art for the same reason that we enjoyed playing kickball, or playing in the forest, or in my case, playing for hours down by the Hudson River in the Hudson Valley. We probably experienced a flow state, as described by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. In his book, Flow, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi describes this it is not peak experience. It is not being in the zone. You are fully focused. You're, you're, you're definitely cognizant of everything that's going around you. It's just that the arts have fully embraced, or whatever you happen to be involved in, it has fully embraced your whole person. I like to describe it as uh, you know, the kid who's playing kickball and just getting called home just doesn't want to go home. <laughs> Or in my case, you know, in, in more recent times, I was living in a, uh, I was living in a, uh, a loft. So everything was in the same place. And my studio, well, I don't know, it was maybe 10 yards from the bathroom. But I was so engaged in what I was doing, I found myself running to the bathroom. <laughs> I just didn't want to stop working, you know? So flow, one of the attributes of flow is that if this is the, activity, the challenge, it, if it really outpaces uh, the skill level, then you're going to be bored. Fui. 
if it's really behind, if your skills lack really behind, then you're going to be frustrated. The sweet spot is when the challenge just outpaces the skill level and it just pulls you along, which is why we just continue to push what we want to do, why we want to run faster and we want to jump higher. Uh, when Mihai Csikszentmihalyi did his study, he found that the people that responded most were artists, athletes, but also mountain climbers and surgeons experienced a high level of flow because they just, there's no way they couldn't be present, right? If you're a mountain climber, you just got to be present all the time. If you're doing a surgery, you have to be present. And that kind of focus just created this wonderful flow. So we continue to push our chairs. This is why the mountain climber wants to climb higher, why the fashion designer continues to design, and why the zero for 15 in the first half <laughs> NBA player comes out shooting in the second half. It's not so much the points as it is the flow. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi did a seven year study where he found most of those things to be true. In the first place he found these objects, is he was experiencing uh, people who experienced great flow, as I mentioned, surgeons and mountain climbers. Uh, he started interviewing initially people who had survived uh, the Holocaust and how they were able to keep themselves sane and find flow. And he found out that there were people who worked in factories and if they were required to do 10 of something, they would see what it took to do 12 or to do 13. And that created what he calls an autotelic personality, or as we say in theological terms, uh, exousia, someone who worked out of the authority of their own self. So he describes uh, people who push themselves in this way as having that autotelic personality. The flow state uh, develops this personality. He comes just short of calling this spiritual development. It is in this and similar texts such as spirituality and contemporary art, the ideal of the numinous. The numinous is a term reserved for experiences of flow and wonder that is found in the visual arts. This is what led me to begin to talk about art making at, at, as a spiritual practice. That is, art practices that develop one's inner self. Obviously, everything on the continuum of fine arts to fine crafts will enable one to develop an autotelic personality. Another area for examination of the power of craft would be a question posed in the last chapter of Glenn Adamson's book, Craft in American History. The chapter is titled, Can Craft Save America? Throughout the book, Adamson demonstrated how America was founded by craftspeople. He reminds us of simple facts such as Paul Revere was a smithy, a silversmith. Adamson summarizes again how without craftspeople, the colonies would not have continued. He emphasizes quite rightly that without craft, the craft know-how of indigenous peoples, the colonists would not have survived. He documents that the craft abilities of enslaved persons added greatly to the craft skills of the colonists and indigenous persons, that there was a synergy that took place among craftspeople that spurred the whole De democratic experiment forward. The contribution of both enslaved and indigenous peoples were by and large mostly unnoted, but it was a synergy that took place between all those groups and craftspeople. So in the last chapter, Addison turns his attention to the present state of America and the role of craft is already playing a role in bringing peoples together, as we're all here together even now. My example of craft that contributes to the development of the beloved community spoken about by Dr. King is the work of Ayumi Ori with the Democratic Cup Project. Beginning in 2016, this craft project brought together many artists to make cups and contribute images that dramatize the importance of the democratic exper experiment in America. Its role was to create positive conversations that would nurture grassroots response to the issues that were arising in our society. As craftsperson, I began to think about 
my role in saving America. But I first had to think more deeply about the fact that craft was saving me. I was crafting a life. In his book, Solitude, A Return to Self, Anthony Storr gives us a glimpse into the lives of creative people. What he found in his research as a psychologist is that not everyone will find contentment in life through traditional avenues. For instance, they were not necessarily going to live in traditional relationships, in extended families, or by working a nine to five job. Storr demonstrates that for some people, just to make it through the day, they needed to spend an ample amount of time in creative work. I found this to be true in my own practice. In my work as a pastor, I loved being a pastor. I had a great time. I mean, we worked across denominations. I won awards uh, from the uh, American Jewish Society. I mean, we were, just, we were just doing a lot of great work together. But I just needed, uh, yeah. uh, whereby my predecessor maybe was 10% uh, introvert and 90% extrovert. I was more like 30% <laughs> extrovert, 70% introvert. I needed to be in my studio. And it took me a while to come to grips with that, that I, I, I just needed to make art just to get along. Uh, and then at some point, I began to uh, miss working on the ideas that I worked on as a pastor. Uh, as a pastor in the Black Baptist Church, uh, you know, you were most, a lot of the work was so much had to do with uh, what was going on in society, what was going on in neighborhoods. Um, it, was very, it was very social. And even though I wasn't a pastor anymore, I still had those concerns. And so this first cell persona was, this was my first cell persona piece that I did. And what I was dealing with, because I had just come out of the pastor, I was working with that idea of introvert, extrovert. And I started thinking about some of the people that I worked with as a pastor and uh, who had been incarcerated. And when they got out into the world, uh, I used to say, I, I was, it was also a time when I was worried about my, my own kind of persona, like who I was in the world. Who am I now that I'm not doing this thing and I'm doing this other thing? And, and then I started to think about people who really had some issues that they were dealing with out there, and there's people who had been incarcerated. You know, they dot the, dot the, sign the box, dot the line, uh, the stigma of incarceration. And so I made these pieces that had to do with uh, well, there, there, were, there were gender issues concerned in them, but also I had them be more or less introverted or extroverted when I made the piece. And so the idea, this was the first piece that I called cell persona, because I said, these are people that don't really get to project or even choose or think about the persona that they have. It's just a given because they had been incarcerated. So this was the first one uh, that, the, the first piece uh, one of the first social justice pieces that I had done. And that led to this series of pieces that had to do with, uh, and of course, now we have the plural, cell personae, and these are the pieces that I have, uh, this was at the Swarthmore Gallery, uh, pieces that I have at the, um, well, there's a few sets in different places now, but, uh, so these pieces, I just did, this piece is called Womb, because we just know by research now how many people are going to end up in jail. Uh, uh, this piece is Khalif Brother, a really sad story about a young man who was incarcerated and he got out and eventually uh, it just hung himself. He was on Rikers Island. This piece here is called Profiling. So these are all my experiences as a pastor, different things that I dealt with. I couldn't believe it. I just, I just did another set. This, uh, this was like, this is the end of four. I, just, I did set number five, and for the first time I had a piece called Visitation Day. And I was like, man, that was one of the, just one of the most horrible times when I, when I was going to visit someone. And sometimes, oh, well, I by and large always got in because I was a pastor, but when I was teaching art at the women's prison, sometimes you go, you wait an hour to get in, and then you, you get to the door and it's like, no, nope, nope, no class tonight. So just that visitation, it was just really, really a stressful time. 
you, sir. Go cool. up there. All right, that's just a close up of uh, the pieces. There were 25 in each set. Uh, the first time I made like 35, but then I cut it to uh, 25 because of the kind of grid that I was going for. Also because uh, of, a, of a statistic. I don't know what that statistic is now. Um, that America is 4% of the uh, world's population, but has 25% of the world's incarcerated persons. And you know, we know that upwards of 46% are uh, people of color, and upwards of those, like 54% are black. And so again, I, I still had that concern as part of my, uh, my way of being in the world. And then I, I don't know if it was the work that I was making. I was definitely going through a hard time. This is from, uh, oh my gosh, what's the name? Williams, Williams' book. Uh, Black pain, we only look like we're not hurting. Oh, gee, should have had that cover up here. But I was doing these ideas. I, I'm also already into this idea of the refuted vessel, but even a cup, like those cups that I showed from the Democratic Cup Project, that. I always tell my students, that if you make a cup, if you make the handle so elaborate and beautiful, we're not even going to be able to use the cup. <laughs> so that the handle is arguing against the function of the piece. And so I decided to purposely refute some vessels uh, because I, I was just going through some things and I was making all this really challenging work. Uh, and so then what happened was, I was like, you know, this work is tough. I don't know how people like Kyle Walker make this kind of work all the time because it's really wearing on me. And so I, I was either going to turn to the gospel, to the blues, or to jazz, or black poetry, uh, because all of those genres kind of transmute uh, suffering. So I, I started turning to uh, poetry. So this is the poetry series. Uh, this is the Amanda, uh, the pieces after Amanda Gorman. I remember watching. I walked away from the television, and then I hear this voice. And I'm like, what is going on here? I'm getting the goosebumps. I go back over, and it's Amanda Gorman. So really just changed the whole trajectory of the poetry series. And again, just again moving myself more and more away from you know, work that was so heavy on me, uh, I started to do this uh, not story series that was just really kind of unraveling language. It also gave me scope and freed me up to, uh, to work with this, what uh, Glenn Adamson called the re-scripting of, of, of slab and coil work. It just gave me a lot more freedom to, to explore and to experiment. Now at Alfred, uh, I'm going to be able to work much larger with these series. And I've also have been trying to lighten the work for myself, to, just to, to make work that just is, is lighter. It's still heavy, heavy work, heavy ideas, but just lightening the series a bit. Uh, even here, you can see uh, this, this is just a lot less severe, a lot less knots. Okay, where the edges just have become, uh, I've curved the edges a bit, just kind of softens that hard edge of those pieces. Okay, and the pinched work. Finally, right? <laughs> where does this work come in? Let me see if this works. First of all, maybe you can get an idea, Zach, of how this happens. Okay, of course, it's sped up. You can see it's all done out of one piece. There's nothing added and nothing subtracted. This is probably one and a half pounds, probably not even. That's like one pound. You can see that's the first flip, another flip. Okay, so, so there's nothing added, nothing subtracted. There's, there's like a bunch of flips she just missed, so I'm flipping it, and I'm hardening it as I go. Let me see if we can just run that. If I'm, yeah, one more time here. So whether I'm working with one and a half pounds or the one up in the show, that was probably four and a half, five pounds. Or if I'm working with 10 pounds, it's still the same process. Of course, you know, one pound is kind of like this. With 10 pounds, you know, you're really getting a workout. So that piece upstairs, all of that piece, everything that you see was out of one piece of clay. <laughs> so that piece is, what is that, like 10, 11 inches? That's big for a pinch pot. A pinch pot is usually, you know, two, 
three inches is bad. Okay. So that should help some. Okay, so this is a pinch pot that's all made out of one piece except for that round bottom dome. That is, uh, that's the only added piece. The rest of that is all pinched from one piece. So the little marks that you see here, huh, right there, those are all pinches. So that's one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> one, two, so all that's pinching. So uh, on my Instagram, you know, you'll see something that takes, you know, 30 seconds. It's probably two and a half, three hours, because you're also doing it while the clay is wet the entire time. Okay. And this is my meditative work. I remember when my diaconate ministry came over the house for the annual church picnic, and they come down into the basement and they see, this was actually me during that time. Uh, they come down into the basement and they see these pinch pieces and they see all the little, they're like, that's what you do on your time off. <laughs> yes, this is meditative. Okay, so. Uh, this one is done in, this is one piece. This is two pieces, and then this is three pieces. Okay. And I was looking at, obviously, uh, well, there's a few things happening here, but um, I was definitely looking at uh, um, Greek calyxes and craters when I was uh, making these work. This is, this is some of my favorites to do. Again, one piece, uh, a lot of flipping, and you know, those, are, those are, oh, so you can pinch that clay also, and as you're pinching it, you just kind of give it a little turn so you can curve it. But the final curve doesn't come until I get to close to the end, and then when, when everything's done, because if I put a different type of pinch in stray, if I can, if I, so, when, yes, if I put a pinch like this, uh, what do I call it, button, I can't, uh, that and doesn't have, when you have buttons on it. But that has to happen, there's no buttons here. That has to happen before I curve that leaf back. So I have to be able to get my hand in there, give it a pinch, and then I curve that leaf back. I'm trying to spend a little more time on the make, and I'm usually uh, talking about all these other things. <laughs> I'm not really spending time on uh, what's happening here. So this is, uh, again, one of these spiked uh, wind flowers. That's a black clay. Uh, this is a large piece, uh, a harpy. So I'm always looking at nature. Nature makes no aesthetic mistake. So how does nature come into a piece like this? Okay. Here. One thing that nature does so well, and nature goes from, oh, in my biostatics class, we talk about what happens under the ground <laughs> before the plant even breaks the ground. And then you have the unfurling fronds that you see and just how a, a flower goes from stem and then if there's like little brown spots on it, they dissipate at exactly the right <laughs> you know, ratio, and then that becomes Corolla, and that becomes Calyx, and then there's petals. Just how nature just, uh, within three inches, there's all these transitions that are absolutely perfect. So I'm always trying to figure out how to make these transitions, which is where the buttons came from. How do I move from this row to that row? Okay, all those kind of things. Those are the kind of things that I'm thinking about um, as I do each piece. And so the harpy, I've you know, seen the harpy eagle, just that wonderful, you know, that, that there, those feathers that come off the side of there. I should have a picture of the harpy on here, but this is a, uh, that's a little, it's a little controlled, uh, but uh, again, fun thing. So then I started getting into what I call a black clay aesthetic, and I also was putting black glaze on pieces uh, doing these uh, black orchid series. And then I, I came to this other heavy time. I was remembering my childhood. I had some, I guess my dad was really sick. I was remembering my childhood of playing with these, these uh, water chestnuts, which are actually called cow chops. And uh, I did this really kind of dark series of pieces. 
again, some of the larger pieces that I ever pinched. But again, just really, just kind of heavy, weighty, emotional pieces. Okay, crafts across continents. And so Jabunia, Jabunala, a South African powder that I met. We met, she saw some of my work and was telling someone, I heard her saying, she's, oh, no, no, these pieces are just, I had many of them that just had round bottoms. She's, oh, these pieces are so African. And so we met, we started talking about the process of working and uh, we just really had a really good time getting to know each other. I showed her, usually it takes somebody an awful long time to kind of figure out how I pinch into the clay. Jabu Nala watches me do one piece. <laughs> I give her some clay and she pinches it right away and then a few days later I get home and she had sent me some <laughs> pictures of some that were, uh, that were done. And so uh, then I started looking at Jabu's work and following some of the forms and uh, minimizing my pinches, putting those, my marks in the same place where she would put her uh, scarification pinches. And now we're presently in a show together at the Red Lodge Clay Center. And so not only is craft answering uh, and saving individuals, but crafts are absolutely, surely uh, reaching across uh, continents. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate it. <laughs>